Hey everybody, I was hoping to put this out last week, but I decided to hold off because, well, you know. But let's go ahead and talk about Wonder Woman 1984, because I think we need to talk about Wonder Woman 1984. This was written and directed by Patty Jenkins and stars Gal Gadot, Chris Pine, Pedro Pascal, and Kristen Wiig. We first saw Wonder Woman, aka Diana Prince, back in World War I, and now we fast forward to that wonderful decade known as the 80s. Diana is working as a researcher at the Smithsonian, and this is where she meets fellow researcher Barbara Minerva, played by Wig. They also meet the museum's newest donor, Maxwell Lord, played by Pascal, a man who fancies himself an oil magnate, but in reality, his business is failing badly. The three of them come in contact with something called the Dream Stone, a magical stone from ancient times that can grant wishes, and surprisingly, it works as advertised. Naturally, this could be a huge problem if it ever fell into the wrong hands. It falls into the wrong hands. So it's up to Diana and the bizarrely resurrected Steve Trevor to put things right. I was looking forward to this movie as I really liked the first Wonder Woman, although I wasn't too crazy about the ending, which Patty Jenkins revealed in an interview was not her original ending. The studio made her put that in. And I totally believe her because it does not fit what the rest of the movie was building up to at all. But otherwise, it was fine. Still, I think, the best DC movie to date. And after watching this movie the first time, I kinda had some mixed feelings. Wasn't really sure what to say about it. So, I did something that I normally would not have the luxury to do. Since it's on HBO Max, I just went back and watched it again. And after the second viewing, I think the word that best describes my reaction to this movie is... underwhelmed. There are some parts that are really well done, there are some parts that are not so well done, and there are some parts that are just yeesh. The movie starts with a flashback to Diana's childhood, and we basically see the Themyscira Olympics, and that opening scene is awesome. Diana enters basically a Themyscira biathlon and tries to take a shortcut after a mistake slows her down in the race, but Antiope stops her because that's not how you win. She tells Diana, you cannot succeed with lies, you can only succeed with the truth, which sets up the theme of the movie quite nicely. And this scene is also one of my problems with the movie, because I was trying to think, what is one iconic scene that you can look at this movie and say, that is the one scene you need to see in this movie. This is what makes it worth the price of admission. For the first Wonder Woman movie, No Man's Land. Easy. For the second Wonder Woman movie, I would have to say it is the Themyscira Olympics. And the problem there is... That is the opening scene. This movie shoots its load right off the bat, and it's all downhill from there. And immediately afterward, we see, in 1984, Wonder Woman foiling a jewelry store robbery in a shopping mall. And it wasn't that great of an action sequence, honestly. It wasn't bad, it just wasn't as good as it could have been. I'm pretty sure half of it was just Diana lassoing one of the robbers and pulling him into a guardrail up on the upper levels of the mall while she swings over to the next side of the mall. She does that more than once in this fight. Like, you can't have run out of ideas already. Come on. Oddly enough, Maxwell Lord's catchphrase in this movie is, Life is good, but it can be better. And that's how I feel about several parts of this movie, including that opening action sequence. And then we're introduced to Barbara, who is the ultimate nerd and social outcast. And basically, everyone shits on her except for Diana. Which really doesn't tell me anything about Barbara. It really it just tells me everyone in the Smithsonian, except Diana, is an asshole. And they both encounter the Dreamstone and make their wishes, not expecting them to come true, but, well... Barbara wishes to be more like Diana, beautiful, popular, strong, and whatnot. And Diana wishes for Steve Trevor to come back. Because apparently in the 70-ish years since Steve Trevor's death, she has never been in love with anyone else. She is still clinging on to his memory. And no. No, I'm sorry, I do not buy that for one second. Not at all. There is even a moment in this movie where Diana, faced with the prospect of losing Steve, says... I will never love again, and fuck off, no. I'm just, I do not buy that. I don't. And Steve does indeed come back to life, although his soul basically possesses some other dude's body, which is certainly a choice. Not the choice I would have made, especially since it really 
doesn't amount to anything except a punchline. Like, there was nothing stopping them from just resurrecting him body and soul. I don't know why they had to go this route. Especially since it leads to some consent issues. There is a scene shortly after Steve Trevor comes back where Diana and not Steve's body are waking up the next morning in bed together. And it's heavily implied they had sex. And ooh. That raises some consent issues right there. That's... that's not good. If I can compare your movie to Stephanie Meyer's The Host, you done goofed. Now, the other stuff they did with Steve, I did mostly like. I love how he is fascinated by everything in the 1980s, even the most mundane things like Pop-Tarts. I like the montage of him trying on different 80s clothes, which serves to remind us all that the 80s were the decade when we all dressed like dorks. And of course, he ends up wearing a members-only jacket. I thought that was a nice touch. And after getting wowed by Pop-Tarts and 80s fashion and escalators in the subway, Diana takes him to the Air and Space Museum, and I'm pretty sure he came twice. All that stuff was fun. It's just could have been a lot more fun without all those consent issues. Just that that was a mistake and there was no reason for it. I did like Pedro Pascal as Maxwell Lord, uh, the aforementioned wrong hands that the stone falls into. I'm not going to say what he wished for because it's a pretty big plot point. And I do like how this character is not necessarily evil, but just easily corruptible because he wants to be a successful businessman and build a better life for himself and his son, but once he gets all the power he wants, he loses sight of everything that is important to him and just wants more power, more money, more, more, more. And considering his business failings are basically due to his own incompetence, it should have occurred to him that getting more power was probably not going to fix that. Powerful and incompetent is not a good combination, as Recent events have shown us. I do like how they incorporated the invisible jet, although the scene where they introduced it just went on way too long. Likewise for the scene where Wonder Woman learns how to fly. It's just, okay, we, we've got this. This all looks very pretty. I love the visual effects here, but can, can we move on and get back to the plot, please? This is one of the problems with this movie. It did not need to be two and a half freaking hours long. There was a lot you could have cut there. The movie also has some problems with how they portray Middle Easterners. I know the movie takes place in 1984, but they did not need to take their depictions of Middle Easterners back to 1984. Oh, that, that was, oh, no. Bad movie. Speaking of the Middle East, while Maxwell Lord is there, he runs into some Egyptian oil magnets who says he wishes for his family's ancestral land to be returned to them and all the colonizers to be driven out. And apparently the stone's answer for this is to just erect a huge freaking stone wall around the land, which doesn't really keep anyone out. I mean, helicopters are still a thing. They can just lay right over the wall. Like, they refer to it as kind of a monkey's paw where you have to be very careful what you wish for because your wish might not come true in the way you expect. But I don't think it's a monkey's paw, really. I think the problem is the stone is just stupid. Oh, and I should also probably talk about that scene where Wonder Woman saves some Arab kids playing soccer from getting blown up by a missile, which is a scene that reflects real world events. And I, oh, hey, hi. I get what they were trying to do there but the, oh no they they should not have done that having an israeli actress save a bunch of arab kids playing soccer from a missile probably not the best way to go there and speaking of said israeli actress her acting has not really improved. I might even say it's gotten worse. Some of her line delivery is just so robotic and emotionless, and every time she says a line that way, I just think, really? That's the take they went with? How bad must the other ones have been if that's what they went with? I also wasn't terribly fond of how this movie treated Barbara, who eventually becomes Cheetah. Once again, they use the tired-ass trope of the nerdy girl magically becoming hot just by 
brushing her hair and taking off her glasses. I mean, that's it. Literally nothing else changes. And of course, after she makes her wish, she starts to get Wonder Woman-like powers, and the movie tries to show that she can also be easily corrupted by the Wish Stone's power, even if she's not necessarily evil herself, but it doesn't really do it in the best way. Early on, she encounters some drunk asshole while she's walking home, and Diana fortunately shows up in the nick of time to save her, and then later on, after her powers have started to build up, she encounters the exact same guy, and this time, she kicks his ass, and the movie is clearly trying to show us that she is taking this beating that she's giving this drunk asshole too far. And I don't think she did. If she had killed or crippled the guy, okay, but she didn't go that far. She just gave him something to think about, because he clearly did not learn his lesson the first time. She didn't give the rapist asshole anything he didn't deserve, and the movie's trying to make us think otherwise, and no, I, I don't buy it. And then, after the second act, she all but disappears from the movie. She basically aligns herself with Maxwell Lord for reasons that are not really fleshed out well enough, I thought, and just kind of becomes a background player until her big fight with Wonder Woman at the end. And speaking of that fight between Wonder Woman and Cheetah, the action was good, but it could have been better. Too much jumping around, not enough fighting. Also, there's one more character I should mention. He is a character that they track down because he supposedly has some book that can tell them some secrets about the Dreamstone. And this is a South Asian man who apparently identifies as a Rastafarian, but also claims to be a Mayan in a past life. And I need to see a flowchart that shows exactly how they came up with this character, because for the life of me, I cannot figure out what the hell they were trying to do here. He only shows up for one brief scene and then he's gone, but man, that character left an impact on me, and not in a good way. I need to know exactly how the filmmakers thought this made sense, because... What? I will say the ending to this movie was much more satisfying than the ending to the first movie, because it actually fit what the movie was building to. Imagine that. It made sense, it was satisfying, and they didn't need to throw in a random-ass fight with the Greek god. My only real problem was, again, Barbara just kinda got chucked aside. One more thing I'd like to comment on before wrapping this up, the soundtrack. Not enough 80s music, not enough Wonder Woman theme. So my final verdict for this movie is, it's fine, but it was just fine. And I was really hoping it would be so much more. I wanted it to be so much more. There was some good stuff going on. Steve fawning over the future of 1984, Maxwell Lord, uh, the friendship between Diana and Barbara, but it also had some plot threads that didn't really go anywhere, the Middle East issues, the pacing issues, Gadot's performance. It could have been much better, but the screenplay really needed another set of eyes. Even if you are in a place where you can safely see this movie in a theater, I don't know if it's worth a ticket price, even as a matinee. I don't think it's worth subscribing to HBO Max purely for this movie. I would say just wait for rental. And that is not the verdict I expected to give this movie, but here we are. And that's all I have to say about Wonder Woman 1984. Till next time, take care.